Welcome to The Third Story. I'm Leo Sidrin. Today's conversation features guitarist Steve Kahn. Steve was raised in Los Angeles in what most people would consider to be a musical household. His father, Sammy Kahn, was a very successful and celebrated lyricist and songwriter who made countless contributions to the American songbook, including Teach Me Tonight, Time After Time, Come Fly With Me, and Let It Snow, Let It Snow, Let It Snow. As a young boy, Steve was surrounded by his father's friends and collaborators. In our conversation, he mentions that Dean Martin was a regular at the house. But as he describes it, his father's world was not particularly attractive to him. And he felt a real distance between himself and his father. Coming of age in L.A. in the 60s, Steve was drawn to music for somewhat more social reasons. His friends played in garage bands, and he wanted a piece of the action. His first instrument was the drums, and although he wasn't a very dedicated student, while he was still in high school, he ended up playing with a surf rock band called the Shantays, who had already had a hit called Pipeline when he joined the band. Oddly enough, it was the guys in the Shantays who turned Khan on to jazz, the music that truly inspired him. At 19 years old, Steve made the switch to guitar. He says when people asked him how he caught up with the instrument, after starting relatively late in the game, he thinks to himself, man, I still feel like I'm behind. In 1970, he relocated from the West Coast to New York, partly encouraged by some friends he had made in L.A. who played with Tim Buckley. He told me, maybe in my life I've done two courageous things. Moving to New York was one of them. What was the second? I wish I would have asked him that. (laughs) As Steve describes it, he hoped to move to New York to play straight-ahead jazz in the classic venues with the classic cats. Instead, he would quickly become an integral part of the recording and fusion scenes. In the 1970s, he recorded on dozens of records, many of them important statements for artists ranging from the Brecker Brothers to Billy Joel, Kenny Loggins to Freddie Hubbard, Ashford and Simpson to Blood, Sweat and Tears, Shaka Khan to Steely Dan. He was really the right kind of player at the right time. And as he says it, he belonged to a generation that loved R&B as well as jazz, rock and roll as well as swing, and who understood the importance of making records. Although he came to music on his own terms and in his own way, he says, quote, I grew up in a house of songs. No matter how far I might want to go in my own music, I still love the song. When I'm doing something for another artist, the main thing that's in my mind is serve the song. However, he still has a kind of complicated relationship with his session past. In our conversation, he talks about the price of playing on so many recording sessions. He says, you think nobody's going to know you're doing this, but in time there is a price that you pay for it. During the period when he was most active on the recording scene, Steve also started recording as a solo artist for major labels. And over the years, he's recorded over 25 albums as a soloist. One particular project called Eyewitness was clearly a watershed moment for him. It featured Khan, bassist Anthony Jackson, drummer Steve Jordan, and percussionist Manolo Badrena. The project seems to have opened a door for him creatively, and since the early 80s, he's pursued his love of Latin music. He's very candid about the existential questions of being a professional musician. He says, quote, I think when you're a freelance person, there's always a fear that the last thing you did is the last thing you did. And he also says, quote, the most painful thing for an artistic person is to confront your own mediocrity. As time goes by, I think the thing to do is focus on what am I really good at? This is the opposite of being terrified of your mediocrity. Focus on your best stuff and find a way to always be closer to that. Man, I love that. That really is like what you need to hear sometimes. It's like food for the soul, you know. Near the end of the episode, we talk about the recording of Steely Dan's Gaucho, which is kind of a companion to the conversation I had earlier this year with Rob Mounsey about the same session. And we wrap up with his love of Latin music and his very personal approach to playing it. This was a long and deep conversation, and for the first time, I'm going to include some pieces of the interview that didn't make the final cut in a separate file available to listen to on the Third Story website. So if you're interested and would like to hear more, specifically about some of the technical aspects of Steve's playing, there's another 20 minutes of the conversation available at third-story.com. When I started this podcast, whenever people would ask me what I'm interested in talking about... I would often answer that I'm looking for the intersection between the personal experience and the art, where your life and your craft meet. Of course, it's not always what happens in these conversations, and it's certainly not any kind of mandate. But it does feel appropriate to wrap up the first year of these conversations with Steve Kahn, because not only is he a great storyteller and full of anecdotes, but he's also deeply aware of how his own life and his own music overlap. 
Before we get started with the episode, I want to play an excerpt from his most recent album called Subtext, which was released earlier in 2014. Here's Steve Kahn's arrangement of the Monk classic, Hackensack. Khan, thank you so much for coming out to Brooklyn to talk to me today. You're so present in my, honestly, in my mind. And I was thinking today about a conversation that you and I had, you know, it's not 20 years ago, but it's probably 17 years ago um, in Vienna when we played that gig with my dad. I don't know if you have any memory of that. I I do, but it's kind of in a a fog of of a bunch of things that uh especially wasn't that for for me kind of a one-nighter where i I flew in and we did something and yeah those those kinds of things are are so blurry to me now i i can sort of see a hall when i close my eyes but yeah what i remember more than the gig was a lunch that you and i had and it was the first time i think that that i can remember somebody sitting down with me and sort of putting my life in a greater context in the sense that you said to me you and i both our kind of second generation. And we both have, I remember you said, uh, come from families where our fathers really work with words and are wordsmiths, I think is what you said. Yes, that was the word my father used to use. It stayed with me. And you helped me to kind of put my life in context in that sense and say, this, this is not, you know, you're not the only one. And I relate to you. And despite the fact that I was 20 and you were already, you know, well Probably into your career, 40s, I think. you kind of helped me to say like, hey, man, I, I see you and I see what, you know, and I know what it's like to kind of try to come with your own thing when you're coming from maybe the shadows of, of someone else. Yeah, I feel, you know, a bond with, you know, many people like, like you. I, I mean, I guess I, I just often refer to it as being the son of a famous father. Mm-hmm. I remember one night, when I'd first moved to New York, so it was in the early, you know, 1970s, thereabouts, I'm sitting in my crummy little basement apartment on the Upper West Side. I was watching Johnny Carson, and Johnny Carson has uh, Rob Reiner as his guest. Mm-hmm. And so uh, Johnny, he asked him, he says, well, that must have been really amazing growing up in your house. I mean, you know, having, you know, Mel Brooks over and, and uh, witty, funny people. Uh, not to mention famous people. And then he, um, then Rob said to him, he said, well, you know, 
it was strange for me just because I thought everybody had Mel Brooks over to dinner. Mm -hmm. So it was like the same kind of realization for me when friends would come over. And, you know, I, all I want to do is go in the backyard and play basketball, you know, play wiffle ball, play mm -hmm. sports. My friends would come in the kitchen. We were getting some, whatever, milk and cookies or something. I mean, remember, this is the 50s and 60s, so it's like Ozzie and Harriet time. Friends would, would come over, and they you know, were wandering or something. Then they come back in the kitchen. He said, oh, my God, did, did you see who's in the other room? I said, I just saw Dean Martin in the other something like that. And I go, yeah, Uncle Dean's here. Yeah. It's, you know, so what? You know, let's go play. I mean, for me... Those were just the people that happened to be around. It wasn't that big a deal to me. But with my friends, I started to realize this is very different. This is not the way everybody else grows up. And I think in terms of my growth as a person, I got more of a sense of what family is by being in my friends' houses, sitting at their dinner table or having lunch with, with their family and watching the interaction with the brothers and sisters because my dinner table wasn't anything like that. You know, it's like I, I would not even want to be in my parents' home. Interesting. Well, it, it does sound like you describe kind of two dueling childhoods. You know, on the one hand, you describe sort of Ozzie and Harriet and a kind of... Well, like, in terms of the, the, the kitchen, you know, the right. things happening around the kitchen, I guess. But it was, what, what, were you in L.A.? Yes, I, was, I grew up in West Los Angeles, very close to um, to UCLA. And I went to all um, you know public high schools. A lot of people see what my life is, and uh, and they they've seen you know pictures of my bar mitzvah book with all these you know ridiculous famous people there. I went to all public high schools, which was I think one of the best things my parents did. And I'm still close with many. Uh, of the people that I went to high school with and, and, and college, I still stay in touch with them. I mean, I wish we were in some ways closer, closer, but at least we have contact with each other. And uh, I have a great uh, warmth and, and sentimentality for, the, for those years. I mean, at my high school, Bonnie Raitt went to, went to my high school. Liza Minnelli was there for like a, a minute, and then she like, you know, went off to some, some private school. But I think Bonnie... And I were the two people that I... Oh, and Carla Bonoff was there, too. Hmm. So there were the three of us. Um, and around the same time? You were there around uh, the same they, time? They were younger. My, Bonnie was in my sister's grade. Uh -huh. My sister's two, young, two years younger than me. So Were you uh, playing guitar or drums at that stage in high school? Or what were you, were you at, musical? At, well, I don't know how musical I was, but uh, I was playing drums. Uh, that, was, that was my first instrument. And, um, you know, after the Beatles came on the scene, all of a sudden there was this shift in the, uh, in the, the universe of, of high school about what pe kids wanted to do, especially guys. You know, guys wanted to play instruments. And so, hmm. you know, I had friends who played, you know, the guitar and all. And so they were going to start a band. And so I, I wanted to be a part of it. Yeah. And the drums looked like the easiest thing. Just hit him. Which, which uh, was the furthest thing from the truth, of course, as you well know. Now, I, I should preface this by saying I, I was forced to play the piano from age 5 to 12, which, which I hated. And I, I learned um, to be sort of a really great mimic. I, I would kind of um, manipulate my teacher into playing the passage, and I would watch her, and, I could, and then I could play it. I didn't want to learn how to read music. I, I was just skating because all I wanted to do was like, okay, time to go outside and play. My father knew that this is what I had done. And, and so he, uh, when it came to the drums, he said, look, it, I'll help you, you know, with friends in the industry, you know, put together a kit from spare parts. Huh. He says, but you have to go take lessons. So he sends me to someone to take my first, first drum lesson. And I'm really excited about it, even though I'm nervous because I, I know there's going to be, you know, reading music and all this right. stuff that I, I, you know, I didn't want to because none of my friends knew it. They just played the guitar. They learned these songs and they just you, you played together. I get into this in the valley somewhere in Los Angeles and I come to this little, I guess, a place where they give music lessons. And there's, I walk into this room. It's kind of a cold, dark room. And sitting in the room, there's two little, I, I guess, drum stools. And there's this little pad with a black a rubber circle in the middle of it, and that's it. Hmm. So the, the teacher walks in, and, he's, and uh, I, I said, Hi, uh, I'm Steve. And he says, Yes, uh, it's nice to meet you. And I said, Well, where are the drums? And he said, 
oh, we're not going to get to that for quite some time. And he started to explain about it. Everything starts with the rudiments and everything is touch. And, you know, so disappointed. I, I didn't get it. I, I didn't get it at all. And hmm. in the end, I ended up drifting around within my friends. Our first band was called DK and the Cavities. But the funny thing about the, about the drums, um, and in the end, this does relate to the guitar. Years later, many, many years later, I'm in New York. I'm at some session for, for something. And Steve Gadd is going to be the drummer, who you know I knew very well and had played with a lot. And of course, I, I admired him, him greatly mm-hmm. for, for 100,000 reasons. So... Steve's waiting for the drums to arrive. There's nothing there but a snare drum. And so, huh. you know, the, the, everybody's waiting for him, you know, because we can't really do anything without him. And so I, maybe the engineer said, well, let me just hear the snare drum. Yeah. And he sat down at the snare drum all by himself, and he must have made music, music at the snare drum all by himself for, I don't know, 20 minutes. And I, I just sat back and I said, here's this guy. He has Nothing but the snare drum, and I just heard more music mm-hmm. than I, I don't know what. And and I, I thought back to that room and that practice pad, and I suddenly I went, I get it. I wish I could have understood it then, but I completely get it now. And yeah. I wouldn't say uh, I was wise enough to convert that to the guitar, but as as my life has gone on in music, I realized that. You know, people are, get so worried about my instruments, my son, my pedals, my you know, my effect. It has all that stuff is just extra, you know, crap. The, the truth is, at least where the guitar is going, probably any instrument, it's all touch. Everything is how the f- the fingertips press down on the string and press it into the wood. Everything comes from that. It's not about all this other stuff. Yeah. And and the guys that play, you know, beautifully, I, I almost always have you know a beautiful touch. And I'm sure you'd say the same thing about the drums, the piano. I, I don't know where that comes into it with, say, the, the wind instruments, but I'm sure there's some, some commonality there. Yeah. I've definitely had the experience of having another drummer sit down at my drums and hearing them, the same exact same equipment, played by somebody else, and you realize, oh, it's, it really is in the person's hands and touch and approach. The instrument is exactly the same, but here's this completely different sound coming out of the instrument. I totally relate to that. And it's particularly interesting to hear you say it because you have such a long standing uh, love affair with the, the kind of additional tools that can craft your sound and create space and texture and all of that stuff. To, to hear you say that, but at the end of the day, it's in your fingers, it's not in the, in the gear. Yeah, it's, it's you know, you, sometimes you just, you just don't get it. Sometimes something, you know, there's a, a cataclysmic event in your life and you're sort of, you have to, to change. And sort of in the process of, of changing or growing, you have these moments where you actually realize something and, and you, you know, smack yourself in the head and go like, why didn't I think of that 10 years ago or five years ago? I, I feel like I've been wasting all this time because I didn't get it. So is there a part of you that sort of still feels like a... A drummer or like you left your drummer identity behind somewhere i would say this uh i definitely don't don't feel like a drummer but over the years the people who really enjoy my recordings begin with drummers and bass players and they love the drumming on on my records i mean how can you not like steve gadd and steve jordan and peter erskine and jack d Jeanette and dennis chambers it's pretty hard i mean these are pretty fantastic players but i think my love for the drums comes with i let them play uh, i let them create things and i i'd never sit there and worry about oh my god this this tune has to be five minutes or less I, I never ever think about that actually i'm shocked if something ends up being five minutes mm-hmm. i mean i'm willing to just let it go because i know you know we're only going to go as far as the drummer takes us in terms of like having a performance and having a kind of energy and and it is always it's physical music to me the other thing i sort of learned on the way about my my love for the drums is that drummers get you know really pissed off when when you just sit there in in the if you're the producer or whatever you happen to be uh where you can boss them around or you can think you're bossing them around Mm -hmm. and it starts to go past two takes 
they get really angry. And I used to like say, well, what are you getting so upset about? Because I'm sitting there, I'll do, you know, you want to do 10 takes? Like, fine. And I, I was, wasn't thinking that it's a very physical instrument. And in the past, they're the only ones who can't make a mistake. All the rest of us can make a mistake. Okay, you know, we'll fix, fix it, it. We'll punch that in, blah, 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 in the, in the old days. The pressure on the drummer is so much greater. So a drummer, as you watch this happening, you realize that the best you're usually going to get from them is the first and second take. So I'm always... Before playing, I have it in my mind that, like, let's really, you know, spiritually get ourselves together here. Mm -hmm. I wouldn't say that to anybody else, but inside myself, and and let's make this great. You know, if the rest of us screw up here and there, fine, but the drums are going to be, you know, great, and the guy's not going to be mad at me because we're going to be, you know, the session's a lockout, we're going to be working all day. Right. So in that sense... Uh, you know, I, I love the drums. I feel like I have great relationships with the drummers, and I don't like to beat them to death because I didn't like something I played. One of the things I was thinking about you in general is how you had this session background, which was very much, I mean, obviously you were always a, an improviser and a jazz musician from the time you came to New York, but you played on a lot of records where the expectation was that you kind of like found the correct way to play it, or you probably, I imagine maybe we can talk about it, had to learn how to deal with producers and people's expectations of what to play. But then there's also this enormous freedom in the records that you make by yourself and that they both kind of have coexisted in your career. James Farber always said to me, you know, one of the greatest people at at figuring out how to slip into a track is Steve Kahn, how to find the right part. And yet when I hear your solo records, especially those kind of trio and quartet records, they're really free. They're really, and I feel that you had like very little uh, impulse to control those guys. And and you and I have talked a little bit about working with different drummers and you kind of have to let people be themselves. If you call somebody, you, 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 particularly you let them kind of be who they want to be and and approach the music how they want to. Yeah. I think this again, sort of also comes back to the life in my family where, you know, I grew up in a house of songs. So I, I love songs. I mean, no matter how far to one side or the other side, I might want to go in my own music or even in the interpretation of a song. I still, I love the song. When I came to New York and just by sheer accident fell into this world of recording, I, I didn't even know it existed. Mm-hmm. I started to see that all these guys were playing these kind of a faceless, anonymous recordings, such jingles, all this stuff. And I felt like, well, wow, this is a great way to survive, to make a living, and, and there's no price to pay for it because uh, nobody knows you're doing it. Mm-hmm. Um, but I think somewhere in the in the late 60s, things had changed where they started to list musicians. You go back to the 50s and look at a Frank Sinatra, you don't know who's playing on any of that stuff. Wow. We only you know, sort of learn who these guys were later. But you know, the more I did it, over the years, and I've talked about this with guys, when I'm doing something for another artist, whatever that might be, the main thing that's in my mind as a, a movable part in somebody else's vision of their song or their album is just serve the song. Do what's right for the song. Don't, it has nothing to do with you know, me or any of that stuff. It's just I, I listen to the song and I try to feel for myself like what, what do I feel is the right thing to do. As you know, sometimes you can think I know what the right thing is to do because that, that's what... I hear, and then the producer or the artist says, no, no, that's not, that's mm-hmm. not what I hear. Can you do this? Mm-hmm. And so you have to be malleable about what you, what you do. But I think you know, my guiding principle is always serve the song. Mm-hmm. It, it's really simple. Just, just do what's right for the song, even if that means like I don't think I should play in letter A. And I've done, I've, I've done things before where somebody called me for something and I tried to play, Yeah. and I've actually said, you know, I don't think I'm the right guy for this tune. And I said, I, I, you know, you don't have to pay me. I, I'm really, you know, so, I said, I just, I, I think I know what you're asking for, but I said, I don't think I'm, you know, the right guy to give you that. I mean, it hasn't happened a lot, but, you know, maybe, I don't know, five, ten times over a long life, I, I know I've done that. In a way, I think it's probably really gracious thing to do because rather than sort of not delivering and then ha- having somebody say, boy, he really didn't, didn't do it you just say listen i you know i don't, I don't know if i'm the right person but it is an interesting move it, it kind of shows that in, sp- in spite of the fact that this is a profession there's also something a kind of higher than that that you're looking at which is maybe serving the music 
Yeah, I mean, and I've had things go the other way where I, I worked hard, you know, tried so hard, and then, you know, whatever, a month later, six weeks later, uh, somebody goes, oh, I played on so-and-so's record. I said, oh, really? I said, I. <laughs> and they say, I... And I said, well, what did, what did you what play on? And I realized that yeah, I got erased. Yeah. So, I mean, I've had that happen too. It, sometimes it's very disappointing because you feel like, well, what, what did I do wrong? What, what wasn't right about what I did? But in the end, you can't beat yourself up too much about that. I mean, because people have the, you know, a vision of what they want, and sometimes it just, it just doesn't work out. I think we started to talk a little bit about your playing drums in high school, but I, I don't want to miss the the meat of the story about you know how you came to the guitar and then how you came to New York. So my parents had gotten divorced. We were really one of the first families to get a divorce because people just didn't do that. This this was in um, sixty three, maybe sixty two. Uh, I can't I can't remember. But how old were you, more or less? I was fifteen. Uh-huh. So I was 60, 62, somewhere somewhere in there. For a time, I kind of I, I identified more with my father as the the wounded person in this event, and um, so I actually went to live with him, which was kind of fun because he was never there. He was, I think, working on Broadway shows in New York. So I had, you know, I'm this sixteen oh, year old like kid, and I had this apartment to myself, which was which is really great. You know, I learned to cook TV dinners. And, but anyway, after a time, he gave up the apartment and was going to be in New York full time. And so I moved back in with, with my mom. And so I had my drums set up in this, in this room. And I remember at the time, the band I had ended up in at the top of my drumming career was a group called the Shantays. And they had this huge hit called Pipeline. Now, I got in after Pipeline, uh-huh. of course. But I mean, we toured, we did, I did all this amazing stuff as a, a really a completely uh, incapable drummer. But they liked the way I played, and I, I, I don't know how I did it. I don't know how it happened. I mean, basically, I hung out with them. I used to go to their gigs all over the place. It was, you know, a very famous surfing band. And were you in high school still? Yeah, I was still at the end, end of high school. And what did your, I mean, it sounds like your dad was kind of not around that much, but what did he think of you touring with these guys and playing these games? I think he felt that, like, uh, you didn't listen to me, you didn't stay with your drum lessons, you know, it was almost like, <laughs> I don't know how you're doing this, this is, I, he came, I think he came to see it once, I mean, it, it wasn't music he understood because there was basically no singing. But through those guys in the Shantays, the two guitar players, Bob Spickard and Brian Carmen. Uh, they live in Santa Ana, you know, sort of Orange County, south of L.A. And I used to go down there, and they introduced me, believe of all things, a surfing band. They kind of got me into all this jazz stuff, including Wes Montgomery. And so I started to buy albums. And in those days, like if my father uh, – I, I was actually, I was earning my own money. So I could take a $20 bill, walk into Westwood, and buy 10 albums. Yeah. Two dollars a piece, and I I just constantly did it. So I was in this period of discovery. So if like I was still a drummer, so I may have liked Wes Montgomery, but if I saw Grady Tate was the drummer, I'd go buy everything that Grady Tate was on. And so I remember sitting in my mother's house one day with my nice silver sparkle set of Ludwig Ludwig drums, and I sat down in front of my kit. And I, I really it was a really sad moment. I, mean, I felt like crying because I felt I, I looked at it and I said like. I can't play. Uh. I had just bought Wes Montgomery's um, Moving West album, and the first thing that comes on in that album is Caravan. And it's really fast, and Grady Tate is playing so fantastic, and he's catching all the big band hits. It's really brassy. It's just... And I, I came in the room, and I sat down. Who's going to want me in their band? Who, who wants a guy who, who can't play? What, what else? What can I do? <laughs> so, believe it or not, this, this, I think I was 19 years old. And I, I had purchased a guitar because I felt like, well, I want to be more musical. So, you know, I learned how to play an E chord, an A chord, yeah. a D chord, the, the open string chords. I don't know what made me think this. I suddenly said, I'm going to become a great jazz guitar player. That's, I, I want to be the next Wes Montgomery. That, that was my, my dream. So, of course, I, you know, I just was like a listening maniac. I, I'd sit in, in my little my bedroom, and I one of the things I bought with my own money that I was earning with the Chantays was a real stereo with real speakers, a real amplifier. So I, I started to, to listen to music in, in a different way. And of course, like I said, one thing led to the next thing. Next thing, you're, you're buying the whole Blue Note catalog, and then you're buying the Impulse catalog. It was, it was a wonderful time. And these weren't records that were necessarily in the house already? Oh, definitely not. 
that wasn't the music. My father's that... jazz records were, you know, vocal records. You know, Ella Fitzgerald, Joe Williams, um, you know, maybe some Count Basie, uh, some Duke Ellington. But mostly be, if, if there had, had been singing on it or, or his tunes interpreted a certain way. But but not a not any of the bebop, the small group jazz. I mean, that, that was, you know, my father. I mean, he he was around all of that his whole life. Uh, but... I don't, you know, because there, there wasn't singing. I don't think he related to it. You know, it's just like, okay, I get it. They're playing, you know, time after time or something. But what's all that stuff in the middle? Why why does there have to be all this soloing and the blowing and the... Well, that was one of the things I was thinking about is like at some point in your discovery of instrumental jazz music, you know, I would imagine that you found the intersection between your father's tunes and the fact that people would improvise over them. And I don't know what if that was something that you knew about already or if it came as you were discovering the guitar. I think I, I was so, you know, hostile to my, by then, to my father's world that I almost, you know, couldn't make the connection. But I remember there was a moment when I had the album um, John Coltrane and Johnny Hartman where the, he sings my father's tune, Dedicated to You. When I heard that, yeah, I started to cry. I felt like, you know, with the lyrics, I, I, I felt like I understood something about my father that I never understood from, like, being with him. Mm -hmm. And hmm. I remember I sent him the album, I mean, the LP. I, I, I sent it to him, and he called me you know, some sometime later, and he said he had never heard it before. And he said it was so beautiful. He, was, he heard it in the car, and he stopped the car, pulled over the side of the and he was crying. You know, because it was so beautiful. So I think in that moment, I felt this kind of connection to my father's world. And one of the the few moments of uh, interconnectedness with, with my, my dad and, and his music and what, you know, what he did is that, you know, when I see all the great players who, who I love, you know, uh, you know Keith Jarrett playing uh, um, "I Fall in Love Too Easily," uh, Ralph Towner playing. I, it, it's it's really a thrill for me because um, these are players that that, that I admire, and uh, you know some of them I know, but still that they choose to play these songs, it, it's really a great thing. Yeah. So there you are, uh, buying the entire Blue Note catalog with your newly purchased stereo system. And kind of becoming, a, at that point, st studying guitar? When did you start to really play? I went, I, I took lessons. I mean, it was 19. And and the funny thing is, a long time ago, when you used to say, like, well, I started at 19, you go, wow, how'd you, you know, catch up so fast? Yeah. You know, I wouldn't comment on that. But as the years went by, I, I, I've, and this is how I feel today. I, My whole musical life, I felt behind. I always feel like I'm behind. I feel like I'm catching up. <laughs> To something. If you ask me today, well, how do you feel I'm behind? You know, <laughs> it it's it it's never stopped for me. So you know, I remember like reading like that Pat Martino had, had had made his first album when he was 15 years old. When I saw that, I went, "How could anybody play that great at 15? Yeah, you know, how is that? You know, it's like and what does that say about the rest of us? Yes, it's like a, the guy's a savant. I mean, now it was brutal, and and I remember I don't know. As I looking, I was looking over my record collection in Los Angeles, and I don't know where the heck I got this idea, but I just said to myself, like, if you're ever going to be a player or, or see if, if you can be a player, you have to go to New York. This actually happened through my father in a funny way, because he, one of his best friends was this uh, percussionist drummer, Stanley Krell, who was in, uh, you know, most people wouldn't know Stanley, but, you know, he played in the pits of Broadway shows. And Stanley had a student, a great uh, percussionist, but really mostly known as a vibes and rumor player, David Friedman. And David Friedman and the bassist John Miller, they were playing with Tim Buckley, the folk singer. And they yeah. were coming to Los Angeles to play the troubadour. And he says, you, you should go you know, meet David. He's a wonderful guy. You'll love him. You know? And so I, I went. And really, uh, I don't know if you know, people remember what Tim Buckley was doing, but it had a kind of jazzy feeling to it in folk music the songs were whether it was soloing david said well let's you know let's jam we're recording at electra but the studio they're not using the studio and so we went down there we played together wow and it felt kind of magical they seemed to like it and they invited me to come play one summer with them at the music inn up in uh, stockbridge or lennox massachusetts i think and we did and they still liked it and so 
David kept saying, he said, you got to move here. And I think maybe in my life, I've done uh, two courageous things. One, the, the one, the most important one was moving to New York. Because that's not like me. I'm a, I'm really a coward. I'm lazy. I mean, I, I'm not an adventurous person, truth be told. And to leave everything I knew and come to this place and knowing two people, it, that's not like me to do that. But sitting here today with you, uh, I would tell you that I owe everything. What, whatever I've become, for, for better, for worse, I owe to being in New York. It, it's just been the, you know, the greatest, I mean, thing. Despite all the painful things that have happened, uh, some joyous things, but I owe everything to, to being here because it, it's, and this is not a knock on Los Angeles. It's just, as you know, it's just so different. This is a tough place. The people who can survive and stay and do it are generally speaking pretty tough people because there's no way you, you come here and you don't get kicked in the teeth any number of times. That's right. And that happened to me many, many times. I mean, many times I felt like I can't do this. It's just, it, it's too difficult. Because you're surrounded. I remember there was this great commercial. It was, it was obviously shot from a helicopter. And the voice in this commercial was Ben Gazzara, who had you know this fantastic speaking voice. You hear Ben Gazzara's voice, you know, it's like it's like the voice of God, you know. It's like yeah. he was the James Earl Jones voice before James Earl Jones. You know, you're 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 coming in from like Staten Island into Lower Manhattan, and you know this deep voice says, "New York City, site of man's greatest achievements and his most dismal failures." In listening to it, <laughs> I, it always stayed with me, but. As the years went by, I'd always say to myself, that's what this is. This is a city of the greatest extremes. You can see the best that, you know, mankind can produce and the absolute worst crap you you ever saw, heard uh, in your life. Or just if you look at how people live, you have the best of it and the worst of it. Yeah. And what's in the middle, you know, kind of gets ground up and put aside. And I think, you know, one of the things... That uh, I always associate you know, you, uh, the movie Amadeus. There's a scene when um, Salieri, who's like you know so envious of Mozart, this little guy with all this ridiculous talent. Yes. And Salieri's in, they're in the mental institution or something, and he's he's like just kind of bellowing out, "Rise, rise, uh, rise, blessed mediocrity." Yes. And I remember watching that scene in the theater I started to cry you know because I I I don't mean like weep just like tears were my eyes because I I realized like that's really that's really all of us and that that the the most painful thing I think for an artistic person someone who really cares about what they do and that could be any somebody who cares about being the greatest accountant in the world it's the same thing yes it's like to confront your own mediocrity is more painful than anything. It's almost better to be, okay, you know, I suck. I'm, I'm completely awful. But to be mediocre is the most painful thing there is. Man, that touches me deeply also. But everybody I talk to kind of confesses in one way or another that they have moments where they really think what they're doing is great and other moments where they really think they're terrible. Maybe that's normal for the process, but but what you're talking about is kind of a deeper pain, which is like maybe you're not great or terrible, maybe you're just mediocre, or maybe I'm just mediocre. That's like that's even worse. I the the other great um, verbalization of of these kind of feelings, and I, I've written about this at, at my website, and it also came from a TV interview. Dick Cavett had uh, Sir Lawrence Olivier on, who I, I just admire so much for you know his body of work. Dick Cavett, he, he's he's talking with Sir Lawrence, and, and they're you know sitting there in the two chairs, and they're like you know not like we are. Yeah, right. And and so he says to to uh, Olivier, he says, "You're considered by you know everyone, all your peers, you know the world as the world's greatest actor." He says, "So like you know, do you ever get stage fright? You know, before you go to do something?" And, and Lawrence Olivier looks at me, he says. Of course. He says, I'm terrified all the time. And Dick Cavett, you know, get, gets kind of like nervous and, he, and he, he says to him, but what are you terrified of? You're the, you're the world's greatest actor. And he says, I'm terrified that I'm going to be found out. He says, found out about mm-hmm. what? He says, that I'm a complete fraud. And I, I sat there and I, mm-hmm. I, you know, again, I again. had tears in my eyes because I felt like that's me. That's, that's my deepest fear. You know, it's, it's like when I used to do sessions i used i used to say god i hope this isn't the day someone asked me to play like james taylor because 
I know how great he plays. I look at it, I, say, I can't do it. Yes, I can like, learn the notes, like, but it, it's not like what, what he does. You know? Or like, I hope somebody doesn't ask me today to play like Chet Atkins. You know? I mean, there are things I know I can't do. Or, or play like Julian Bream. You know, forget it. Those are the things I, I live with, and you know, you just hope they're not going to happen. But it's like those are the things that in that world that make you feel like a fraud. Then there's the other thing, like God, I hope uh, you know they don't call this standard tonight. Like, I, I don't know that one so well. So, you but isn't that funny like that. that we always walk around with? I mean, I feel that with myself too. I'm walking around constantly aware of what I'm not, you know, and especially when you have seen it, you know, like I grew up around really great specialists and technicians on all of their instruments and i'm much more of a kind of a little bit of everything you know i so i what i do is the collection of all of these like kind of diverse little talents adds up to something but i'm not a specialist as a drummer and i'm not a specialist as a guitar player and i'm constantly worried that i'm not measuring up in any one of those categories and some people might look at it and go how could you know but look at what you can do but I'm only walking into every situation thinking about what I'm what I can't do. Like you say, you, you you walk into a gig and go, please don't make me play like James Taylor, the one guy that I feel like, or one of a half a dozen things that I feel really uncomfortable with. It's just funny. That's what we bring with us is our own Michigas. You know, there's something you said is is really great, and um, I think I've said this to you know students and um, in in clinics and master classes. And what what you're saying is is pretty much what this thought is it's that as time goes by you know when i'm giving it advice to somebody i think the thing to do is to like focus on well what am what am i really good at not this is like see the opposite of that you know being terrified of what's mediocre about me yes it's like saying well what do i do really well what's what is my best stuff and focusing on that and finding a way to always be closer to that yes. than the, than the stuff that makes you uh, listen back to, to yourself and go, oh God, I suck. And, you know, back to, to something you said before. I don't know that I've ever been around a great player at a gig, at a recording. Whoever came in the control room or came off the stand and said, "That's the greatest," if I can say this, "That's the greatest shit anybody ever played." All the greatest players, they go, God, you know, even if I come up to them and go, yeah. man, you sounded so great tonight. Yeah. I said, oh, God, I suck. That was terrible. That was just really – and I, I wonder, like, well, what am I hearing? Well, but that's exactly it. People can't hear themselves sometimes, I think. That's a big part of it is that they you, – you know, you can never really – I talked to Gil Goldstein a couple weeks ago, and he said, you know, Mike Brecker until the very end always said, it's not. I didn't, I didn't do it. No, I got it. Yes. That, I mean, I always think of, of Mike, too, yeah. because he was the most – humble person i mean and we used to have in that band when it was randy mike sanborn don grolnick will and myself uh we'd have these great philosophical arguments in, in all the in the travel and they were just fantastic there's just some really great minds in in that band yeah, no and you know especially between like michael and don and and randy and myself we'd we'd have these talks about our heroes and on all this, all this stuff. And I remember, you know, times talking with Michael and just, you know, where he's bemoaning how awful he's playing. I said, Oh, did you hear that? Oh God. I said, he said, oh, I'm playing the same stuff over and over again. It's just terrible. And he, and I said, well, why don't you just quit playing? If you don't like anything, he said, Oh, well, I couldn't do that. <laughs> <laughs> you know what? I think that actually kind of sums up this tension in so many musicians and probably artists of any creator, which is living with this, pain of feeling like you're not living up to something and yet knowing that you have no alternative you know it it's kind of in there in that swampy mess you know i think you know we all have our heroes are in this like exalted place that we can we can never get to it, it wouldn't matter if uh you were voted uh, you know best uh, tenor saxophonist of the decade that doesn't mean anything i mean the heroes that you worship those guys, they're just up in this place, and you can never get there. The thing is, at a certain point, you have to stop thinking about that and sort of kind of create your own place for yourself because you have to let go of, of that stuff. You can't be like that. You can't go back and, and remake, uh, you know, one of those Blue Note or Impulse records or Columbia. You, you can't do it. It's not going to happen. So with the understanding that at a certain point you made an effort not to be thinking only about your heroes, who were your musical heroes when you uh, started to work professionally as a guitar player or try to find your sound? 
my, my heroes were, were Wes Montgomery, Kenny Burrell, Grant Green, and, and Jim Hall. Those, those were my, you know, my, my favorite players. Um, you know, there were lots of other guys I listened to. But when I, when I came to New York and started to talk about my guitar heroes to trumpet players and, and saxophone players, they'd look at me like, we don't, we don't listen to any of that. Well, not, what were they listening to? Oh, they were listening to to Train and Sonny and uh, and uh, uh, Bill Evans and uh, McCoy and. So was it the sense that they weren't taking the guitar players as seriously? No, as the, they were? I mean this is one of the realizations I had too. As much as I adore Wes and Kenny and, and Grant, speaking in linear terms, e- even harmonic terms, if you weigh it, the, the chordal stuff against the piano, it's the guitar is like a tinker toy. It isn't anywhere in the same hemisphere as as what. The tenor saxophone, the trumpet, the acoustic pianos, it's, there's nothing to talk about. And so you know, start, I started to realize, like, wow, I'm, I'm worried about the, the wrong things. Do you think that's a function of the instrument or of the way people were playing I think it's, it's the way – I mean, the guitar uh, you know, was always kind of a um, second-class citizen. I, some people used to call it the, the ugly sister of jazz because the guitar was the last instrument to get in the big bands – it was the last one to be able to, you know, play lines. I mean, it, it was it wasn't doing much of anything. So, huh. by by the time the guitar started to do stuff, a, a language had already been created. All and so the guitar had to graft onto what it had, which was a lot of blues language, all these uh, mannerisms that came from all the other instruments. So, you know, the guitar, you know, really in the greater scheme of things, really wasn't doing anything. Uh, of, of great depth com- compared to the, the tenor sax, the, the you know the piano and and uh, and the trumpet. I mean, there's nothing to talk about. But I think what you see, like when I came to town, John Abercrombie came at the same time, and Sco came like a couple years later. I actually, little known story, I lent John an amp for his first gig in New York, which wow. was with drummer Horace Arnold. And John was coming down from Boston, huh. and the three of us, we you know, we've been friends for a long time. But you know, we we just kind of came here together more or less. But of this generation of guys, John and I were sort of you know came here at, at the same time. Mm-hmm. Uh, Ralph Towner was already here. Mm-hmm. You know, there was a lot of you know great things going on then. But if you look at that group of players, I think the thing was is that they all realized, even though they all liked Wes and Jim Hall, you know, very very much. But they realized there was a, a linear depth that came from the other instruments that the guitar didn't have. And what I think, in the end, we've kind of brought to the guitar, and the guitar, again, as a music-making instrument, has changed so much to the point where you see some of the best recordings in, you know, whatever, maybe starting in the 80s and yes. going on to today, were led by guitar players. But it doesn't sound like guitar music it just sounds like music that happens to be being played by a guitarist yeah. and it, it's a complete change i think i mean i don't feel any less for wes or kenny or grant or, or certainly not for jim hall i adore those guys i always will yeah but i think you know what they did in a way on the instrument has helped what what came afterwards and and at best you know we're a really positive reflection of of what those guys started. So when you moved here and you sort of got a little bit of a wake-up call that there was a whole other set of listening that you hadn't been focused on, did you adjust what you listened to and how you listened to the music? Well, I had all the music. I I just, I think I started to listen to it differently. I have a memory of you telling me a story, and I don't know if it's true or not, but so I'd like to ask if my memory is sort of right, which is that when you moved to New York and you had a couple of people that would kind of take you around, I remembered you telling me a story about like going to the Vanguard on a Monday night and then on like on a Tuesday going to some recording session. It was like all the same cats that had been down at the Vanguard the night before. This was, again, just after I'd moved here, I I think. So I could have been in 69. But I went to down to the uh, Village Vanguard to see the Thad Mel Orchestra. And I, I think I went with David Friedman. And so, you know, I'm there and I'm expecting to see uh, Sir Roland Hanna and, and Richard Davis. <laughs> and I walk in and, well, where are they? And then suddenly the band goes up to play. And then I'm sitting there going, oh, my God, that's Chick Corea playing piano. <laughs> and Miroslav Vitus is playing bass. <laughs> and, you know, it was like the band went into 2020 right away from, yeah. from being in, in, in 1969. You know, 
It, it was the most incredible night. And of course, I, I, you know, I could name, you know, everybody in the Reed section, the, the Bones, the, the Trumpets. I, I knew the names of everybody from, from the records. So it was really thrilling being there. So the next day, David, uh, he says, come on, I've, I've got, uh, you know, two or three jingles. To, okay, I want you to see what this is like. So we go to this little studio. And I, I'd never seen this before, you know, then in my life. I didn't know what this world was. We walk in, and the first session, there's, uh, I think, you know, Mike Maneri was there, Thad Jones was there, Mel Lewis was there, mm. and, and a couple other guys that, that I'd seen playing the night before. And here they are playing, you know, for uh, detergent or something. And I, I, it didn't make any sense. How, you know, how can my, my heroes be doing this? This is, you know, this is so disgusting, you know. <laughs> and then... I, I you know, we go out in the hall and then there's a there's a catastrophe and and like um I, I remember this happened and I hope I'm not offending anyone saying this, but they're running around looking everybody's looking for Jimmy Rainey, who's supposed to be playing guitar on this thing, you know, one of the great jazz guitar players of all that. A, a jingle. They're look and somebody I hear somebody yell, Oh Jesus, you know, he's he's drunk again, he's he's not gonna come. And there's Billy Muir another great guitar player, walking through the hallway. And they go, Billy, 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 so sorry. You know, do you have a 15 minutes? And he goes, sure. And I watch him walk in, put the music in front of him, bing, bang, boom, he plays and, and he leaves. And, you know, it was a certain level of, of musicianship. Then somebody tells me, I said, well, who's in that studio over there? I hear this music. I'm, oh, that's Chico Hamilton. He's doing, doing a jingle. And it was just like this shock, like I couldn't, it didn't make any sense to me. What you know? What are my heroes doing? Doing this? So that that's what it was like. Yeah. Eventually, you you were doing sessions. The guys say some some kid is arriving in New York today, and six or seven other guys are arriving, and they're probably all really great players, and they don't know each other, and somehow they're going to find each other, and ten years from now they go, well, look what happened. You fell in with so and so, so and so, and so and so, and and now you guys are the lifeblood of the music. But could I have known that I would come here at a time, at the same time, you know, Michael Brecker was going to come here, David Sanborn, Steve Gadd, Will Lee, Randy Brecker was already here. By just dumb luck, I fell in with this kind of family of, of players. It was just dumb luck. I'd seen those, the sessions we just talked about, but I, I didn't want to do that. I mean, I, 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 want, I, was, I was headed for... I wanted to be on Blue Note. I want to be on Impulse. I want to play at the Vanguard. I, you know, I want to play at the top of the gate. Those are the things I wanted to do. But when somebody, you're playing in a club somewhere, and some guy comes up to you, hey, kid, uh, you know, I, I, I like the way you play. I, I really do. He said, you know, can you read music? And I said, well, yeah, I think I, think I can. <laughs> and he said, like, um, well, what are you doing tomorrow at 10 a.m.? I don't know. He said, are, are you in the union? He said, yes. He said, well, here's an address. Be, be here at 10. Bring your guitar. It's a commercial. And you go, and so they like you. And you say, well, okay. Well, and, and you just keep the phone rings, and you just kind of keep doing it. And you realize, you think, at that moment, well, nobody's going to know I'm, I'm doing this. It's, it's a faceless kind of, uh, yeah. you know, no, nobody knows who's playing on these things. But in time, there, there is, is a price to uh, pay for it. Which is what? Well, it's, I think, I, again, I always think about this relative to dear Michael Brecker. You know, it's one of the, I don't know, one of the greatest instrumentalists of, of all time. I mean, one of the great tenor saxophonists, a, a visionary musician. And yet, in his obituary in the New York Times, uh, where we should be celebrating a great artist, there's a little backhanded, you know, uh, slap in the face at Michael for that he played on a lot of pop records and stuff. And I think in some way it doesn't matter, but there is a, is a price to pay for it. Now, in my case, when I made Tightrope in 1977, now looking back, I don't have the greatest feelings about it. Then I thought like, well, okay, my, now I'm going to make records. We, you know, we were all playing fusion music at yes. the time, which is, is not jazz. Uh, it has some of the jazz aesthetic to it, but in the end, it's not. And certainly my record, I, I wouldn't you know, put, if there was a separate fusion bin and a jazz bin, I, I'd put it on the other side of it, on the fusion side of it. But I was really into it. You know, and I felt like I was single-handedly keeping the Brecker Brothers band sound alive with mm -hmm. the three horns. So I'm expecting you know, great things to happen for myself. And the next thing I know, the first... You know, Columbia Records was great. You know, they had a, a clipping service, and they patched together all your reviews, and they mm -hmm. you know, send you a big envelope once a month or something, and nice. you can see. Well, most of it's, you know, not what you'd want to see. But yeah. 
the first one I pull out of the envelope says, Session Man Makes Album. And like my heart, I got sick to my stomach. I'm like, yeah. wait a second, what is that? It was so painful. And as time went on, you know, as I started to have, you know, a printed bio, and this is way before websites and things yeah. like that, I just started to take out every pop, R&B, rock, anything I'd played on out of it. I, I didn't want anybody to know about any of that anymore. And it was still really hard to escape that and just have, you know, judge the music on what you hear. It has nothing to do with any of that other stuff I did. Yeah. But you can't. I mean, once people know about it, it's just there and, and you just kind of have to let it go. Sometimes it's really hard for me to do that, but... But to me, what it sounds like is that jazz was the exalted music and anything else was kind of paying the rent or you were a professional and a, and a, and a technician and a, you know, a craftsman. A craftsman. I, look, I look at it as being a, a craftsperson. But you wouldn't even put that in the same category as the music that you want to make or, or love to make. Well, you know, it's a, it's a hard thing. I, you know, people, like sometimes they see all these records you did and they go, oh boy, that must have been great. I mean, <laughs> you know, and some things you have a a good feeling for and but a lot of it you don't and i would always say like for every hundred things you have to do a hundred things to maybe have two or three of them that you're really going to treasure that that were good experiences uh, on all levels because i would say like you know everything is conspiring to make it a bad experience it could be you know i mean how good can a track be if the drummer's bad or like the drummer's great, the bass player's bad. Or how good can it be, the whole band is great, and it's a lousy song. Yeah. Or how good can it be, everything is great, and the singer's lousy. So there's a hundred different ways it can, it can be lousy. Yeah. To have it all kind of come together in a way and have it be a, a, a you know, great experience of making somebody's song wonderful. Yes. Uh, it's really... It's really rare when you can do that. It's funny when you talk about how could I know in 1969, 1970, that 10 years later, you know, this unit of cats that happened to all come to the city at the same time and find each other through a series of coincidences and, and experiences would be the sort of the one of the dominant forces in the music. How much of it do you think was that you all had, even though you came from different places, a kind of compatible conception of the music? And how much of it was that it was just that generation of people? I mean, what was it that brought that group of people together? I think we were a very lucky generation of, of guys because we did all like the same thing. For some reason, we all loved R&B a, a lot. You know, whether it was the old, you know, James Brown records or Aretha or Ray Charles or all this early kind of funk stuff that was happening but we you know we also loved rock and roll we all loved the beatles Jimi hendrix we were also the same guys who were listening to train and bill evans and miles and all these other things so we felt comfortable moving from one thing to another and sort of when it was okay to blend these things together into one music whatever that happened to be we were all comfortable doing that it didn't seem like a bastardization of Mm -hmm. of the purity of any any one of those genres or elements. It's also, I think, when you study the history that surrounds the music, like, you cannot separate, you know, black politics from the music. You, you just can't do it. Even the most noble white musician, whatever you are, whatever, even if you're in those bands, you're still not really a part of it because there's a, a politic going on that's so much bigger than all of this stuff. And mm -hmm. I remember looking at um, there's a there's a great uh, DVD series of interviews. I think it's called Miles Davis, a, a New Kind of Blue, where it's basically the Isle of Wight concert uh, with Miles, Gary Bartz, Chick, Keith Jarrett, Dave Holland, uh, and mm -hmm. Jack DeJohnette, and Ayerto. You know, it's not necessarily the greatest concert. I think it's like eighteen. It's one eighteen minute piece. I, I think. And then there's a series of interviews with the guys and how Miles affected their lives. Mm -hmm. it's, inc it's an incredible DVD package. But I was watching it, and I was struck by, aside from the you know, huge afros and all this stuff, that Gary Bartz had a button, a you know, black power button. And I, I started to think to myself, like, you know, no matter how much, how many, you know, it's in England, you know, how many white hippies are out there, you know, smoking dope and giving the peace sign and all that stuff. There's an element of this music, who's to say that all of it, that, that's about, 
you know, the black struggle in America. That's why some of I mean, is so powerful because it, it speaks uh, for something that, that's just so much bigger than, than the music. And you can obviously have empathy for it and stuff, yeah. but you can't ever really know what that experience is like. But that's interesting because at the same time, this, in general, the generation of players, especially, you know, the sort of Brecker Brothers universe, there were a lot of white musicians in that, in that scene. Yes. So how do, how do those get reconciled? I don't know. You know, sometimes, you know, it's like we've talked about this, you know, the, the relationship of, you know, Jews in, in jazz and Jewish, Jewish musicians. And you look at, you know, how many wonderful you know, musicians are at least culturally Jewish, you know, and, the, and a lot of people have always said that, well, there's this bond between, you know, the Jews and African Americans mm-hmm. because of the, you know, the universal suffering and all this stuff. But, you know, sometimes maybe in some way there's a humanity that binds us all together where we can come together and, and you know, say make music together or do something artistic together. And for a moment, really be be tied together in in a oneness of trying to do something together where you, you do forget about all this other stuff even though you really can't it it's it's always it's always there yes i mean i listen i, I don't when i hear people you know on on the street uh say derogatory things about jews and cuz they don't know i'm standing there they don't, yeah. you know they don't know. Uh, it's really painful it, it's it's really hurtful you know, I don't think of myself as a religious person at all. I mean, I see myself as a spiritual person, but uh, but I know I know where I come from, and I'm, I'm culturally, you know, a Jewish person. Many years ago, when my my son was uh, considerably younger, when I was trying to figure out things to do with him, especially during the winter, mm-hmm. I ended up getting into ice hockey, and we'd go up to to Madison Square Garden. One night we were going up there and there was a, a McDonald's across the street from, from the garden and we were going to stop in there and get, I get a burger or something. So I'm standing there and I, I'm not going to say what the particular ethnicity of these young girls was, but we're standing in line and just minding our own business, talking to them. And, and two young girls are in front of us and they have a, um, a Macy's bag and the one girl saying to, the, to her girlfriend, she says, um, I saw... You know, I was up in lingerie or, or, you know, blouses or whatever, and, and there was this sale, you know, and I really wanted to get that thing. He said, but, you know, I started to think, and then I started to become all Jewish and shit, and, like, I, I decided not to buy it. And I'm standing behind them, mm. and and I'm saying, like, to myself, I didn't say anything to my son. Yeah. I don't think he was paying any attention, but I said, like, this is how people see us. You know, that one of the first things is that Jews are cheap. You know, or it's always something about money. Yes. It was so hurtful. You know, it was really painful. And um, this is the other funny thing about New York. You know, people say, oh, this is the great melting pot. But that's a, that's a lie. I mean, the truth is we all come into Manhattan and we all work together. And then everybody goes back to their neighborhood. It's, mm-hmm. it's like what they used to call um, de facto segregation. Mm-hmm. And, and it's understandable. And people want to be with their own people. Yeah. So I understand why... This group goes to that borough, and uh, but when we're all there working together, it does feel like a melting pot. But we don't do anything together other than that. Well, I think we travel together. I mean, I think one y- thing yes, in, we in travel New York, to, right. we, we got to go underground, and we got to all get on that same tube and travel in the same space. And and that in and of itself is a kind of a radical departure from what the rest of the country has to go through. Because I grew up in a place where you got in a car, and so did everybody that's, else. That's how I grew up too. So you would never really be forced to kind of go through this common thing together. But but I, I totally hear you. And I also hear that the music is one of those areas where that can be kind of like everybody's equal on the bandstand. You know, everybody has to see each other as, as equivalent and equal. And, you know, the other thing that you, you mentioned in the story about going to hockey with your son that I wanted to mention is you are a big sports fan. And... And I wonder to what extent your relationship with sports has, if you see it, any parallels between team sports and making music, or has it affected you in, in any way? Well, I do think, you know, a band is, is like a team. I mean, I, I do think there are many aspects to it that are just like that. And it, it is about doing something, you know, well together. Where the whole is more important than, like, the great quarterback or you know if if the great quarterback in your team is is the the tenor saxophone player you know everybody knows he's the best guy but 
we're all there together to, to do something together. And, and it's sort of, it isn't about, I think the other thing is like, it's not about get a rhythm section, whether it's two guys, to, whatever it is. And the idea is, okay, you guys make me sound great. It's not about that at all. It's about let's do something great together. Mm-hmm. You know, I mean, it's really funny. Uh, as much as I, I love sports, I think there was a time in my life where, uh, because I just there are things I just didn't get again as because uh, guys uh, mature so much slower than women. Uh, I mean, I feel like uh, in many ways, uh, you know, sports helped to uh, ruin my marriage because I let it ruin it and any number of other relationships too. What is it? What do you mean? I had a particular way of living, you know, watching sports, going to, to the things, and not that I could afford to go to things then. Hockey was, you know, not that expensive to go to. But I think, you know, if you're going to have a relationship with somebody, you've got to be a participant, not a passenger. And I think spending so much time doing things that women just do not want to be around, eventually you have to let it go. And I, I think that's that's what I've done. doesn't mean, I mean, I still follow things, but yeah. I don't think I would ever let it get in, in the way. I mean, my ex-wife, I, I remember she always used to make jokes that, that on our first blind date, I said, yeah, I'll, I'll meet you uh, at the White Horse Tavern, but after the hockey game's over. I mean, she always made fun of me. For, but like, if that was happening now, the date would be at seven o'clock and I wouldn't care what I'm missing. Right. Uh, but it's interesting that it wasn't music that came out there, that it was sports, you know, that it wasn't you <laughs> were out hanging every night in at Sweet Basil it was that you were you know focused on sports yeah it was <laughs> Sweet Basil or 7th Avenue South yeah. uh, you know when my son was born I, I kind of had to, had to make a decision like am I going to continue to do drugs and and just be you know screwed up all the time or am I going to be a responsible father and to me uh, there wasn't a choice it's just you know be responsible so uh, I, I just kind of like stopped doing everything mm-hmm. and um, and stayed that way. It uh, doesn't mean I don't remember what that st- stuff was like, but it also meant like, you know, sometimes when your friends are doing drugs all the time, you can drift apart because if you're not doing what they're doing, it seems like you're not friends, but you are, but you just don't want to be around that stuff anymore and and all the crazy shit you do to get it yeah. the really dark places you end up you know you either stop or it's, it's like if it's a choice of my son having you know shoes or going to a good school or, or me going out and getting high and be out of it all the time i mean there's no choice i'm gonna take care of my son yeah that that's uh hopefully the slap in the face that most people get and it also seems like of that generation i can't speak um and and i'm not certainly asking you to like name names but a- as i've seen and talk to people from your generation, it seems like for the most part, everybody kind of cleaned up at some point. They kind of... At, at some point, yes. But I was, of, of, of those guys, you know, I was one of the first ones to have a kid. You know, it affects, in my case, you know, sometimes your musical choices. Like, like John Abercrombie, who I adore, you know, we're still friends. You know, John doesn't have kids. So he's not confined by that particular kind of responsibility. Now, he's had a relationship with Lisa and a marriage, you know, way longer than anything I've ever, you know. <laughs> so to me, in that world, whatever they've gone through as a couple, you know, they're a, an amazing success to me. Right. But whether John went to Europe with a trio and maybe he's going to lose money wasn't affected by, oh, my God, how am I going to pay for my kids this or that? And so what are some of the choices you think that you made as a result of trying to be responsible to your family? I was afraid in some ways to to do more touring. Like if I look at myself and my two pals and players who I I admire greatly, Abercrombie and Schofield, they both paid the dues going to Europe with small trios like Sco with uh, Steve Swallow and Adam Nussbaum Mm -hmm. and Abercrombie with with various things uh, where they probably didn't make much money, nothing, but they were bonded together with their bandmates and paid a price to make themselves, you know, jazz personalities. Yeah. And they, they deserve everything, you know, where they've, where they've ended up because of that. But I, you know, I was afraid to do that because I was worried if I leave here uh, that my son's, you know, mother's going to sue me and I'm going to be in trouble. And I was afraid. And that fear really held me back. Yeah. I mean, it's my fault, but that was the choice I made. And as a result, what were the opportunities you think that maybe did present themselves 
for you here? For example, do you think you did more session work because you were here? I, I guess so. I think when you're um, a freelance person, wh- whether it's jazz, it, it doesn't matter really You know what it is. I think there's always a fear for some people that like the last thing I did is the last thing that I did that like nobody the phone's not going to ring tomorrow I'm I'm not you know there's going to be no more work usually it does ring yes May, okay maybe there's a week or a bad month bad couple months but something it, it keeps it keeps going but the fear that it's over is very real and especially like I said when something bad happens like when you get erased I've never felt if you ask me today somebody called me for something my first thought would be I wonder how many other guys they called before they got to me? I mean, that's how I've always, you know, seen myself. I, I never felt like, you know, somebody like Steve. You're, I've got to have you to do this. But that's so interesting, man, because your sound. I think even on some of the sessions, certainly the Steely Dan stuff. You, it's you, man. It is. I hear you playing on that stuff. Yeah, you know, it's funny when I listen to some of it now, which I, I rarely do. Uh, I realize that there isn't that great a difference between how I was playing in Eyewitness and what I was bringing to, uh, you know, Donald and, and Walter's music, even though it, it sure felt very different, but it was just lucky. I mean, <laughs> that, that, I mean, mostly we're, we're talking about the Gaucho album yes. because I, I played on one song on Asia by just dumb luck. It was the hit Peg, but uh, the, the solo, everybody thinks when I say I played on it, they think, I played the solo. That's Jay Graydon, which was like the twentieth solo or something. I, I something I, I never. Lucky for me, I, I can say that they never asked me to play a solo, so I I didn't I didn't have anything to do with that. Yeah, didn't get erased on that one. No, Gaucho is a record that for me was very important, and I I agree with you that as I talk to different people, it's very easy to get kind of hung up on the mythology around Steely Dan. It's one record and one time in your life and a thing that happened. The only reason I bring it up is really to say. I hear your personality and your sound on it, not some sort of neutral, invisible, nameless guitar player. So the idea that you think, well, why would they think it's Steve Kahn who's appropriate for this? I think that, that there what had to have been some thinking that you were the guy. Honestly, even today, like, I don't know. And I, I used to see on other things, you know, Donald a, a lot more. Uh, I mean, I don't mean a lot. I, yeah. I, don't, I don't know that I would say we were friends. I'm trying to think if we ever had a lunch or a dinner together outside right. of a recording studio yeah maybe maybe once uh, but you know they have a particular idea about what they're looking for and I, I think that's why in many ways Larry Carlton just always sounds so great in the middle of their music I mean I, you know he's kind of the, the perfect guy I mean he always he brings a, uh, his blues sensibilities and he has you know jazz sensibilities too and and so between those two things that that's really what they like I mean yeah. I remember, when I went in there to play um, the, the solo on, on My Rival, uh, their instructions to me was, and I don't remember whether Donald said, sorry, Donald, because uh, Walter was kind of out of it during that whole record. But mm. I remember Donald saying, so listen, I want you to sound like Howlin' Wolf's guitar player if he could play changes. That's what I'm looking for. So, you know, right away I just, you know, said, mm. he's talking about, you know, blues. And that's 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 what he likes. But remember, there are these sophisticated chord changes, right. too. So I wouldn't say that's what I tried to do. I just kept that in the back of my mind. As you know, when I talked to Rob Mounsey, he told me a story from the recording of Gaucho. And he suggested that I cross-reference it against your memory of this story. The session that sort of went all night, D- Donald and Walter left, and you stayed in the studio to do the track. Yes, and this is in reference to, to the song Gaucho. I guess we'd been playing it all all day i might have played two or three other versions of it before that with different the, rhythm sections with different or? drummers the rhythm section was almost always the same i mean basically it, it had been don grolnick and uh, paul griffin were the two keyboard players hmm. i mean lucky for me i mean i i was sort of around to see all of it and the funny thing no was kidding. like i used to say to him i guess it was so frustrating i said i'm like you know how can you go wrong with rick Murata, bernard purdy <laughs> Or Jeff Percaro. I mean, how it's just not possible that they can play bad on anything. And they were all giving everything they had every time, all, all of them. It's fantastic. And so, you know, like each guy was sort of there for a week. So we're, this wow. is the, the Jeff week. And I mean, everything we played with him, you know, we're playing basically the same, I don't know, seven, eight, nine songs. When Jeff was playing that, I mean, it was so fantastic. We didn't have drummers like him in New York. Huh. I mean, to me, Rick was 
hands down the, the best guy for anything like pop and R&B. Sometimes, you know, Purdy was, of course, yeah. in his world is the greatest thing you can imagine. It, you, you know, when you get special Bernard, like you got on Babylon Sisters, yes. when you get something that's so special like that, it's a treasure. I mean, it, it's really a treasure. And he just played ridiculously great on that. I can't tell you how many drummers I've heard sit down at a kit and say, dum, dum, dum. <laughs> you know, just that fill like that. It becomes so influential for so many people and generations of players that I think that's why people are so obsessive about some of those records because they actually really become like a big part of the language that people speak. When people ask me about that record, I mean, that's the only thing tune that I really feel good about because that's really what we played. I yeah. mean, I don't remember anybody fixing anything. You know, and I remember Purdy, he's, he's so classic. And he was the only guy who could get away with this with them. Yeah. He, we, we did, I think we did two takes. You know, he was, he was smiling after the, the second one, which is, is the one you hear. Everybody's gathering in the control room to listen. I mean, we knew how great the song was. I mean, it, that was from the second you started to play it. It was, it was obvious. So Purdy comes in. He's already got his winter raincoat on, he's his, his hat playing. on. He's got it. And he, he walked in. He listened. <laughs> and he says to them, he says, fellas, that's it. <laughs> and he left. <laughs> and he left. And, and it was so great because that's what it, the way it should be. Yeah. I mean, he did. He, how can you play any better than that? Yeah. Well, and I guess that kind of speaks to what you said before is like drummers, they want to do it in a couple of takes and, that, and it's physically demanding. And Yeah, he's very much. I mean, listen, those three guys, Bernard, Rick, and Jeff, they're all like that. You know, Jeff would get furious. I mean, I saw him, you know, put sticks through his tom, floor tom, uh, throw sticks across. He got re he'd get really angry. With multiple takes. But more than that, he felt like the reason for doing another one was nonsense. Yeah. I mean, he was verbalizing kind of what we all felt like. You know, I mean, obviously we can't hear what they're hearing, but for crying out loud, I mean, I'd sit there and go like, boy, if this was my record, I, I would have taken the one from two times sure. ago. Those of us who were there, we all feel like we're the ones that saved the day. Because, yes, it's true. I mean, there was a point where Donald and Walter got just so fed up that whatever they were looking for cosmically, they felt they weren't getting that. Which is, what could it possibly be? I don't have the slightest, I'm telling you, I don't know how many takes we did, but Jeff was fantastic on every single one of them. I mean, but when they did the song with Rick, he was incredible. Purdy was, a, I mean, I don't understand any of it. But you have to kind of tune that out because I've got a job to do too. Yeah. You know, I, I've, you know, I don't want to make a mistake. I don't, I don't want to screw the drummer up. So... They just said you were leaving. And, you know, Gary Katz is sitting in the control room with his hands on, over his head, you know, just going, oh, my God. And, and I remember, I mean, my recollection is that I went in there and I said, look, it, we can do this. We're playing this really great. Right. It's really great. I said, I don't know what the hell is with those two other idiots. I mean, yeah. you know, you can, I'd talk about them that way to their, their face, yeah. you know, it, does, it doesn't. Yeah. Yeah. You know, I mean, what's going to happen? They're going to fire me? Okay, fire me. Yeah. I said, we can do this. And so... You know, we went back in, and what happened was, you know, finally he agreed to say, well, let's, I said, we're here. Where the hell are we going? Jeff's yeah. in New York by himself at a hotel. Right. I mean, we might as well play. Let's, let's play. We can do this. And so we, we went back, but it was very weird because Gary, we do something. We do like a bunch of great full takes, and you go, okay, now I need, do you see these four bars here at the, whatever, letter C? I need those four bars. And you would just play those four bars? And we'd, and we'd just play those four bars. I mean, in the end, they ended up cutting together things from whatever it was we did. And they, you know, I remember the next day or something when Donald and Walter heard it, maybe Gary, I spoke to one of them and they said, I think we have it. I said, well, I, I hope so. But but that's my recollection of, of yeah. what happened. But I just know it's one of those times where everybody cared so much about that damn song. Yeah. That, and and the sad thing about it is Anthony went through all this, and in the end, Walter erased him. Yeah. And Walter played bass, but Anthony Jackson played bass. The interesting thing also is that there obviously is something specific they were looking for. The fact that Gary was saying these four bars, those four bars, meant that he was. He was aware of what was happening on the other side of the glass, that there were very specific things, but they weren't able to articulate it. And instead, it sort of lived in this kind of mysterious, ephemeral kind of like intangible world that I just can't imagine putting the greatest musicians in the world in a room and then saying, you know, you guys just can't. You're not making it. 
once you kind of know what they're looking for, basically they're looking for a drum track. Yeah. They, they'll erase all of us yeah. if they've got the drums that they like. Yeah. So you realize that and you just try to play something that's music, musical and usable. And so, but it may be supportive too. Now that I think about it, right? It, it might change the way you think about it because if your real function there is to support the drummer to make sure that the drummer plays the right thing, it actually takes a certain amount of stress off of you because you just have to feel good. I always, anytime I worked for them, I always felt I was going to get erased. Right. I, I never left feeling like, oh man, this is this is this is going to make it. I, I, I left saying, well, I wonder who's going to end up. Uh, you know, playing that. Is that, that. Is, that hard, is that a hard thing to sort of manage to sort of be, because there's a little bit of a fear factor in it, right? Kind well, of. It's, I, I think it's your professional pride. I mean, you, yeah. you want to feel like you did a good job. Yeah. It's funny, we, when we were emailing before, you know, we're, we're sitting here today, you know, I mentioned that there are four tunes that we did that were absolutely, uh, to this day, I, they're, they're so fantastic, yeah. and they didn't end up on the record. One was called Second Arrangement, which yep. is the famous one that an assistant accidentally erased the whole tune. Now, that one, I played on that too, the version because Rick Morato is the drummer on that, but they erased me from that. <laughs> but I, even if it had come out, and I, you, know, I'm, you wouldn't see my yeah. name by that tune, I would know somehow what I was playing contributed to right. why Rick was playing that way. You know, my dad always used to say to me, the tape captures a, a magic to the extent that if you do a take and it feels great, you can replace everything on that take and the feeling is still on the tape. But if it doesn't feel right and you think, well, that's okay, we'll, we'll replace everything until it feels right, you might never get it to feel right. And the thing that you bring up is very interesting, which is what is the function of the musician that is erased but is playing there when the rhythm track is recorded? Well, that's a kind of uh, you know a cosmic question that I, I, I certainly don't think I have the answer to. But like I said, I do believe that whatever it was that I was doing yeah. helped Rick to do you know what he was doing. Changing gears, one of the things I was thinking about as I listened to your more Latin records is that I don't know what the function of guitar was in playing Montuno before I heard you do it. I mean, maybe there were other people doing it, and I'm just a little ignorant about it. But it seems like that is an area that you found a, a way to participate. You know, this has become... You know, maybe it was there from the beginning, you know, a real passion for me. And and I remember, you know, when I started diving into all the salsa clubs and going to listen to all the great bands play. And why did uh, you do that? Why did that happen? I mean, my interest in the, in the music had, had always been there. Manolo, Badrena, he used to, when we had done these eyewitness records, you know, periodically he'd come up to me and say, you know, wow, the people in Cuba... They they love what we're doing, hmm. and uh, people in Venezuela, where you know all these places, and and I go, you're kidding, and he says no, and you know it's hard to believe him sometimes because he's such a frenetic character, and and you know he's speaking in in broken English and hmm. all this stuff, but eventually I started to actually meet the people from Cuba, from Puerto Rico, from Venezuela, from Colombia, from Brazil, from, and they'd all tell me, I don't mean hundreds of thousands mm-hmm. of people, I mean you know some people that. Those eyewitness records changed my life. They changed the way I hear music. You know, and again, I, when I think about it, to me, it, it's all Anthony, Steve Jordan, and Manolo. I mean, I know I was important to it, but drummers and bass players, they listen to that stuff, and, and rightfully so. I mean, Steve and Anthony, it, it's just, it's another world the way they're playing. And Manolo adds this other thing that he's a brilliant guy in, in a crazy way. After my divorce, you know, and, my, and Nancy... It was from Puerto Rico. And unfortunately, during our UC, I didn't really take advantage culturally of everything that, that I could have because I was just stupid. <laughs> of all things, you know, we get divorced, and I started to immerse myself in the music. I mean, I already loved the music and was listening yeah. to it. And one of the first things, you know, the guys who knew me, they knew my records and stuff. They didn't realize how much I really loved the music. Yeah. And th- the first thing they would say, you got to go back and start listening to Arsenio Rodriguez. You know who was the great, uh, you know, trace player. Yeah. I think I think from Cuba. And so you know, I went and bought all those records, and I you know tried to learn what he was doing. But the the stringing of the trace is so different that the guitar, like the higher note, is the top string. It, yeah. it's it makes things come out so strange, but obviously fantastic. And then I st- started reading up on the history and realized that the trace was there before the piano. And then the f- piano, unfortunately for the trace, you know, phased it out. 
And then there were some other groups like the La Playa uh, Sextet, I think had guitar in it. It was one of the first ones that had guitar in it and, and no piano. So yeah. there's a history of all these things going on. And then you had someone, um, you know, wonderful like Nelson Gonzalez in the Fania years who was playing. So it, it, it was there. There was a, a role for a, a stringed instrument, yes. usually the tres. Yeah. You know, I, I felt like the guitar can do this. It can do it in its own way, yeah. and I can use the kind of harmony that I hear. I don't want to do this with a keyboard because it'll just get in the way of how I hear things. And so when I had the the opportunity presented to me by Dave Samuels to join his, uh, as a co-leader, the, the reconstituted uh, Caribbean Jazz Project with mm-hmm. Dave Valentin, yep. um, I jumped at it because he said, you know, we'll do it without a keyboard. And our original goal was to try to do it old style with conga and timbal. You know, it was hard to sort of maintain that, but we made two records together, and that was where I started to see, like, wow, that there's so much possible. And, of course, like Eyewitness, I like the space, that there isn't this dense stuff being filled up by the keyboard. Yeah. And so as I went to the to continue in, in, in this direction with the records like The Greenfield, Borrowed Time, and then more recently Parting Shot and Subtext, which are really the embodiment of what I was trying to do, those last two. Yes. Each step of the way, I was finding about the, the guitar can, can, can really do this, and with a big, warm, dark sound. Because if you, if you notice, like, in all the you know, great salsa records, most of the, the sounds, the electric keyboard players, are so abrasive sounding to me. I agree. But the players love it, and they respond to it, and, and you know, who's going to argue with that? It, but the well, sound is is really abrasive. I agree. I mean, I I would argue with it. I mean, there must be a function for it. I don't know if it has to do with dancing or getting on top well, of yes, the brass. Well, yes, every well certainly. That's the other thing. Everything is for dancing. And like when people say it makes me want to dance, I'm happy. You know, there there is also this kind of ebb and flow, this balancing act between maintaining authenticity in the music and then also finding some bringing something that really is not particularly. I don't want to say it's not authentic, but it doesn't have the same rich tradition what you're bringing to it is honoring the tradition but actually playing something that hasn't really been done is not so common but at the but i also know that you you're very respectful of the authentic rhythmic tradition if you ask me you know there's nothing traditional about this This is like you know kind of new territory that you know for the moment i may be the only guy exploring it uh, in this in this way, which is nice. It's kind of my area, and, and I, I have it for the moment, you know, all to myself. When I did Parting Shot, that was the first time, to, to my knowledge, that a pure wall-to-wall Latin jazz me- record had been made led by a guitar player. Not since Grant Green's The Latin Bit mm-hmm. in uh, 1962 had a guitar player been a leader of a Latin record. In those days, it was really funny. You know, Grant Green... The Latin bit is considered, you know, kind of a classic Latin jazz record. But on that record, there's no guiro. There's not a cowbell to be found anywhere. There's no cascara. N- none of these sounds that are so important to Latin. And, and Willie Bobo is playing on the record. But a lot of these records in that period, you know, they're produced by white guys. Yeah. Who, I don't know what they were afraid of. But for some reason, it seems like they were terrified of the cowbell, yeah. terrified of, of the clanging of the cascara on the shells of the timbal. I guess they didn't like guiro either, because the only there's only shekare and and and, and the symbol, the bell of the symbol. Yeah. Th- that's it. A- and on a lot of records, it was like that. So it was really strange to me from that period that, and you listen to all those Creed Taylor productions. They're they're very much. The same thing. The Cal Jader records. Yeah, it's really weird. I don't know what those guys were thinking. Eventually, you started to see the cowbell at least infiltrating into there. But I, I have no idea what they were so afraid of. Interesting. But, you know, to me, uh, you know, if you don't have those sounds, I, I don't know why you know you bother doing it or thinking it's Latin music. Steve Kahn, thank you so much, man. It's been such a pleasure, really. Thanks, Leah. Thanks so much for inviting me. It was it was a lot of fun. The time just flew by. I'm scared to look at. I know. <laughs> Let's, uh, I won't tell you. <laughs> All right, man.